placed the stethoscopes uh, to her and then looked around, at, looked at each other rather dumbfounded and seemed surprised that she was not dead. Believing she was dead, the attendants had taken off the ghastly strappings and electrodes and the black belts and so forth. And these had to be readjusted again and, and she was given more electricity, which started again that kind of a ghastly plume of smoke that rose from her head and went up against the skylight uh, overhead. After two more of those jolts, uh, Ethel Rosenberg uh, had met a maker. She'll have a lot of explaining to do, too. Dear Diary, I was supposed to be having the time of my life. I was supposed to be the envy of thousands of other college girls, just like me, all over America. Look what can happen in this country, they'd say. A girl lives in some out-of-the-way town for 19 years, so poor she can't afford a magazine, and then she gets a scholarship to college and wins a prize here and a prize there and ends up steering New York like her own private car. Only I wasn't steering anything, not even myself. This was my one big chance and I was letting it slip through my fingers like water. There are 12 of us here, and I suppose one of my troubles was Doreen, a society girl with bright white cotton candy hair and perfectly shaped and polished nails. She had a lighthearted cynicism about her, and she singled me out immediately. The boys like her so much more than me, with the one exception, perhaps, of Buddy Willard. Buddy Willard went to Yale. That afternoon was the Ladies' Day banquet. Before I came to New York, I'd never eaten out in a proper restaurant. I don't count Howard Johnson's, where I only had french fries and cheeseburgers and vanilla frappes with people like Buddy Willard. I love food more than anything else. No matter how much I eat, I never gain weight. My favorite dishes are all full of butter and cheese and sour cream. I run my eye down the side of the menus until I find the richest, most expensive dishes and order a string of them. My boss, JC, had called me into her office that morning, asking if my work interested me. Well, of course it does. I said it loudly, hoping this would make the words true. What do you have in mind after you graduate? I don't know. I don't know. I had a thousand answers ready, but I couldn't stop it coming out. I don't know. I've always thought, perhaps, that I might go into publishing. You ought to learn several other languages to distinguish yourself from every other run-of-the-mill person in publishing, she told me. But there wasn't a scrap of room left in my senior year for that. I went back to the hotel and cried. Silent, awkward tears. I wish my mother was like JC, wise and powerful. My mother wanted me to take a course in shorthand, saying it was the only way I'd be able to support myself. I will never learn shorthand. I could be a botanist or a biologist. But I don't want to be a botanist or a biologist. Buddy Willard was the scientist, the doctor. Buddy Willard was stupid and he was a hypocrite. Oh, I had adored him from a distance for years before he even looked at me. And then there was that beautiful time when I loved him and he started to see me. Then just as he was looking at me more and more, I discovered quite by accident what an awful hypocrite he was, and now he wanted me to marry him, and I hated his guts. I remember the day he smiled at me and said, Do you know what a poem is, Esther? No. What? I said. A piece of dust. This, this, this shit, darling! Buddy was a bit older than I, and very scientific. I squirmed, trying not to drown when I was with him. I kept begging Buddy to show me some really interesting hospital sites. So one night, I cut all of my classes and came down for a long weekend and he gave me the works. He showed me where they had the big glass bottles full of babies that had died before they were born. The baby in the last bottle was the size of a normal baby, and he seemed to be looking at me and smiling, a little piggy smile. He stood there in front of me and I kept staring at him. The only thing I could think of was turkey neck and turkey gizzards and I felt very depressed. Now I saw he'd only been pretending all this time to be so innocent. I simply had told everyone that Buddy had TB and we were practically engaged. What I didn't tell them was that I didn't want to be. This morning I woke up in Dr. Gordon's hospital. I felt the shape of a room around me, a big room with open windows. A pillow molded itself under my head and my body floated without pressure between thin sheets. A lot of things have happened in the past couple of weeks. 
While I was still in New York, I started thinking about Buddy, and when I went to visit him while he was in the hospital with TB. On the way up to the hospital, Mr. Willard must have thought I was crying because I was so glad he wanted to be a father to me, but I did not want to be his daughter. When asked to be Mrs. Buddy Willard, I had an awful impulse to laugh. I'm never getting married. Anyways, on my last night, I went out with Doreen and met this guy Marco. This man was wearing an immaculate white suit, a pale blue shirt, and a yellow satin tie with bright stick pin. I couldn't take my eyes off of that stick pin. He wasn't very nice to me though. He was violent and pushy. He got dirt on my nice dress when he tried to sleep with me. Good thing I stabbed him with the sharp heel of my shoe. I didn't want to lose my virginity to him. It was a bad note to leave on, and I looked like a sick Indian, so I called myself Pollyanna Cowgirl, but I was really looking forward to my writing course when I got home. When I stepped from the air-conditioned compartment and got into the car, Mother said I didn't make the writing course. The air punched out of my stomach. How could I not get in? What was wrong with me? And what do I do now? I think it was these thoughts that left me unable to sleep, write, or read. At any rate, I'd be lucky if I wrote a page a day. Now I knew what trouble was. I felt no purpose. I hadn't washed my hair for three weeks, and I hadn't slept for seven nights. Slowly, I came to terms with the idea of killing myself. I just wanted to be through with my life. After seeing Dr. Gordon with eyelashes so long and thick, they looked artificial. I knew that I had to try and live another life. I decided to walk to the bus terminal and inquire about the fares to Chicago. And they would ask, what is your name? And I would reply, I am Elliot Higginbottom. But instead, I took a bus that would stop just two blocks from my house. I climbed after Dr. Gordon's dark jacketed back, trying to ask him what shock treatments would be like. But when I opened my mouth, no words came out. The nurse said not to worry, but when I shut my eyes, something bent down and took hold of me and shook me like the end of the world. I wondered what terrible thing it was that I had done. I tugged my black veil down to my chin and strode in through the wrought iron gates. None of us had ever visited my father. I thought that if my father hadn't died, he would have taught me all about insects, which were his specialty. I laid my face to the smooth face of the marble and howled my great loss into the cold salt rain. When it came right down to it, the skin on my wrist looked so white and defenseless that I couldn't do it. It was as if what I wanted to kill wasn't in that skin or the thin blue pulse that dropped under my thumb. After that, I tried drowning and hanging, but my body wouldn't allow me to accomplish either. My mom had left for work when I took the sleeping pills. I dragged a chair into my mother's closet and reached for the small green strong box on the top shelf. I unlocked the box and took out the bottle of pills. There were at least 50. I knew just how to go about it. I unscrewed the bottle of pills and started taking them swiftly, one by one. The silence drew off, bearing the pebbles and shells and all the tatty wreckage of my life. I opened my eyes, but it was completely dark. I had woken one of those state hospitals, you know the kind, where all the crazies go. The crazies and the disgruntled staff who try to serve two kinds of beans at the meal. I wasn't sure why Mrs. Guinea had turned up. In the new hospital, I had my own room with a woman doctor. She promised no more shock treatments would be administered without fair warning. I was content there. No one bothered me. I just grew fatter and fatter. I even found Joanne in a room next to mine. I had never known Joanne, except at a cool distance. She had brought along newspaper clippings, each one a different title, different story, but all black and white, and all about me. I moved up to Belsey where piano music sounded at the end of the hall. Dr. Nolan unlocked a door and led me down a flight of stairs into the mysterious basement corridors that linked in an elaborate network of tunnels. I saw the high bed with its white drum-tight sheet and the machine behind the bed. All the heat and fear purged itself. The bell jar hung, suspended, a few feet above my head. I was waiting for the miraculous change to make itself felt, but all I felt was a sharp pain. A warm liquid began seeping out between my legs. Joanne led me to a hospital and made sure that I was in safe hands before she left to hang herself in the middle of the woods. The world itself is the bad dream. I took a deep breath and listened to the old brag of my heart. I am... I am, I am. The eyes and the faces all turned themselves toward me, and guiding myself by them, as by a magical thread, I stepped into the room. <laughs>